friends. This is the final roundtable for today in Saratov. Uh, before we begin, uh, may I please ask you if if we have non-governmental officials in the room, raise your hands. Do we have representatives of small, mid-sized business here? Raise your hands. Students, raise your hands. Good. So we more or less understand what the audience is made of. Thank you so much for coming. Environment for life. Uh, apartment and city is taking place for the second time. Last year it took place in Kazan and this year in Saratov. And there's also a program of city weekend. Many of you have probably visited our city picnic. And today we will have fireworks on the uh, astronauts embankment. Tomorrow we'll have the business program. Looking forward to see you. I think that the forum this year is mostly aimed at the active participation of the citizens. For this reason, this part of the forum is um, uh, formed as a round table with experts. Very often experts discuss everything under the clo behind the closed doors, but this time it's an open discussion. Thank you so much for finding time to come here. We'll also have excursions around the city, the guided tours. Tomorrow will be the last day of our fora, but we still hope that we manage to change something for good in Saratov. And now let me give the floor to Rosalia, the moderator of the next round table. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm very glad that we finally gathered here around this table with a little delay though. My name is Rosalia Tarnovetska. I think something is wrong with the microphone. Can you please correct it? My name is Rosalia Tarnovetska. I'm the program director of Saratov Forum and uh, we'll talk about Saratov today, uh, about the prospects of development and risks. Uh, the main topic for the discussion is uh, the following, how to uh, correctly develop the Sar potential of the city of Saratov. Uh, the colleagues, speakers, experts, many who traveled uh, here for the first time share their impressions and everybody is nicely impressed by Saratov. Yes, indeed, Saratov preserved a lot of unique historical architecture. This is a rare thing for Russia because very often we had periods of very tough implementations of new buildings in the historical cities and uh, this led to the abrupt uh, ending of the uh, uh, of a certain period of city's development but this is not the case for Saratov besides many people know that Saratov quite recently in the beginning of 20th century was a city the third largest city in Russia it was bigger than Kazan and Nizhny Novgorod while today it's not even among top 10 cities of Russia although together with Angels if we add it they would definitely definitely be included in top 10. In spite of the advantages and the cultural potential of the city, Saratov is uh, facing a lot of challenges today. How to develop in the future? The first challenge is the territory of the airport. In the coming two, three years, um, uh, the airport uh, has to be moved because it's located in the city center and there will be a free site instead of the airport. How to develop it? That is a question to be answered. Uh, also, uh, there's a unique wooden uh, housing and uh, buildings preserved in the center of the city. They are decaying on one hand. On the other hand, they are unique and they should be preserved for the sake of uh, culture, history and identity. Identity. And the question is how to develop it as well so that it becomes economically efficient and it becomes a point of growth. Besides, in Saratov, one of the biggest sightseeings is the Volga River and the embankment. So how to develop it? Uh, I think everybody visited the picnic today uh, during the city weekend program. And we tried to show how the public realm can be developed. But in general, there can be many options. 
and um, I think that Evert Verhagen will tell us more about the approaches we can use when we develop the industrial embankments. Besides, let me introduce our speakers. First of all, Dmitry Tepin, the Ministry of Construction and Housing, Saratov Oblast, Sergei Serdukov, the founder and chief architect of Snow Project Bureau, Alona Zhmurova, head of Saratov Project from uh, uh, Strelka KB, um, uh, Mikhail Alexeyevsky, uh, head of uh, City Anthropology, Strelka, Evert Verhagen, founder of Creative Cities Company, and Mr. Dwayne Phillips, director of DPZ Europe. Uh, it's a company that jointly with Strelka uh, develops the um, uh, public realm in Saratov. And let me give the floor to Dmitry Valentinovich. Uh, we have 10 minutes. Thank you, Rosalia. Uh, good afternoon, dear participants of the roundtable and guests of Saratov. I would like to thank you all for finding time in your tough schedule to come and visit our beautiful city and enjoy its hospitality and participate in this business program. I would like to thank Aizheka and Strielka as well. Within the framework of our joint project, they um, open our eyes to very uh, simple yet very useful things uh, that we would never think of and they managed to show us how we can develop the public spaces with another level of comfort and this helps us to make the life beautiful and better for our population. As for Saratov, yes indeed, quite recently, 100 years ago, it was the third largest city in Russia with a developed economy. But then different um, events took place and today Saratov is the way it is. So as of today, uh, the population is 850,000 people, 480,000 square kilometers is the space. The city was founded is in 19. Oh, oh. We have a lot of um, uh, architectural monuments, historical heritage in Saratov. So when you initially take a look at all this, you want to say that uh, the approaches we had until recently, before we started the collaboration with all our stakeholders, were quite inefficient. So what we did in the past was uh, we were efficiently doing the mass construction. We managed, uh, we learned how to build one million square meters of uh, housing and buildings per year. We were supported by Aizheka. Uh We were given the land plots, we were doing the construction, but the level and the quality of this construction is really outdated and it doesn't match the requirements of the modern society. Uh, as of today, we can see that the public realm and um, the civic spaces we have need to be uh, developed more efficiently. And this is possible only if we have an efficient feedback from the population, if we have a desire of the citizens to change something. We have developed a number of uh, proposals. The first one that we really believe is one of the most efficient proposals, is the longest pedestrian street in Europe. We want to implement this project. And uh, we have the first pedestrian street in Russia. It's even older than Arbat. It's the street we are on today. It's the Nemetskaya or German street. Now it is called the uh, Kirov Avenue. We managed to extend it within the framework of the joint uh, program with Strielka. And this year, within the framework of the federal program, we're going to uh, build um, about two more kilometers of this pedestrian street. The unique thing about this street is part of it will cover the embankment. And on the embankment, we want to start the construction already this year of a comfortable beach. And this beach will end up in a city park located in the central part of, the, of Saratov. 
Besides, we can see the development of different other territories in Saratov, near the train station. You have a, um, you have a device to click the presentations. OK. So another space to be developed is the area around the train station and the other parts of embankment. We are also um, uh, looking at the possibilities to merge with our satellite city, Angels. It's on the other bank of Volga River. And together, we will efficiently develop them, as well as the uh, two adjacent suburbs, Artichesky and Saratovsky suburbs uh, adjacent to Saratov. Uh, this all will result in a development of agglomeration. They are highlighted in blue. This is the so-called Saratov agglomeration. Altogether, it will have the population of 1,200,000 people. And an important part of this project is the fact that we're building a new airport. It will bring about uh, different logistics to the development of territories. And thank you for mentioning, Rosalia, that the airport uh, um, of Saratov, located in the city center, and many of you traveled from Moscow and elsewhere, you saw the airport. It's quite a big territory, right in the center of the city, about 240 hectares um, of space that can be developed efficiently in the most modern way. I have to say that our city is very often called a student city. We have more than 100,000 students in Saratov, and one of the main strategies we envisage today is so that the students who live in the city, who visit the city for studies, would uh, have a desire to stay in Saratov so that we could retain the intellectual potential of these students and we would convert it into the intellectual and therefore economic potential of Saratov. Also, I have to say that Saratov has a well-developed uh, history associated with the Volga River. Every fifth family in Saratov used to have a boat in Saratov. And we have a well-developed culture of spending leisure time um, on the boat, uh, on the isles, etc. So we need to develop this potential for tourism and recreation. Uh, there are lots of touristic um, boats um, on Volga River, and the potential of tourists would be three million uh, per year that we would like to cover. I'd like to mention the cultural component as well. Maybe you have already met the culture, the historical part of the city. We have a historical castle with lots of uh, architectural monuments. Unfortunately, most of them uh, are not in the best condition possible. However, we really have a vision of the concept, and we started the reconstruction of our architectural heritage. The Moskovska Street buildings uh, are uh, almost all renovated, except for some facades and the roofs. But we will be aiming at the full, complete reconstruction of all the architectural monuments. Of course, this work has to be done on a regular basis. For this, we need to implement the design codes, standards of refurbishment and development of the territories. And our partner, Strelka, is really helpful in this. I don't think this product will be used only for Saratov. In the future, it will be adapted for other cities similar to Saratov. And once again, I'd like to say that it's a really great pleasure to be trusted and to be given this possibility to implement this project in Saratov. Yes, indeed, we are a pilot project today, in a pilot project today, uh, uh, and, uh, for example, the um, pilot project of the development of um, the territory around train station is a very important one. We are constantly in touch with the local population. I'd like to say it's quite shocking and challenging to uh, have such an abrupt implementation in the city realm, um, whereas the population is used to a very, let's say, slow rhythm of life. Uh, uh, per day, I would say the area around train station um, 
hosts around 30,000 pedestrians, and we want to conceptually change it. Uh, the routes and um, ways the traffic is organized for decades now have fully changed and we have traffic lights and a different way of organization. I would like to bring an example uh, to how well the communication is working. Um, my, um, um, I have a relative, she phoned me and she said, I live near the train station. Please tell me, Dmitry, is it true that this building will be demolished where I live? Uh, so these are, of course, rumors, but uh, the project uh, Strelka is implementing gives a lot of informational possibilities to the citizens. And this is a great opportunity to make our city and all the other Russian cities better. And let's keep in mind that uh, apart from Saratov uh, streets, we have other important public territories such as the yards. And yards are very important structural units for the city population. And the development of standard code design uh, for the yards are equally important as the project of the um, development of the train station area. And uh, it's uh, good that we have uh, enough uh, skillful architects to work under this project. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Tepin, do you already have a st any statistics, any figures on the pilot uh, the project, any applications? The pilot project was launched yesterday. Yesterday night, we completed all the works, so it's too premature to conduct an assessment now. But we have exchanged some opinions. Uh, we already have about 10 letters from the population. We are looking, reading them, and reviewing them. Uh, the test um, project is designed for one year. The scheme is tested until we start the implementation of the um, development of this train station area in 2018. So during this year, the test uh, project will be ongoing. And how is it going to take place? The project will be adjusted and amended during the test period. Will there be any change, physical changes on the train station place? Yes. We, for example, is, are going to fix the traffic lights. The test refurbishment is not changing any geometry, any this big things about the design. But the small architectural forms, uh, as well as the traffic lights, will be adjusted and changed. And uh, the population, of course, are free to give their feedback whether or not to add something or to take away something. I think the pilot refurbishment project is something really new for Russia. And it means in a year we will have an entirely different product after the real uh, refurbishment um, project is implemented. And there are big expectations, of course. Great. Let's pass to our next speaker, Mr. Vitaly Kudryavtsev. He's the head of the chair uh, of uh, Saratov State Technical University called Design of Architectural Environment. Good afternoon, dear participants of the roundtable. I'd like to raise some other challenges related to Saratov because of course, everybody is going to talk about Saratov. I'm rather interested about some essential issues. Let's start from the fact that the travelers in the beginning of 20th century were writing that Saratov, by its look and character, uh, looks like quite a southern city. And the second observation was they believed that Saratov is the most European city on Volga River. What are other features of Saratov? If we look, think in what, when, where categories, I could say when, where, and how. Let's look at the historical plans of Saratov and 19... I'm sorry, 1590, the city was founded. Uh, 1674, uh, the city was finally settled on its contemporary place. 1707, uh, Saratov uh, has already depleted the territorial medieval possibilities, and uh, he, it, the city gets a new plan, and 
1803, 1810, 1812, different uh, versions of city planning. The administrative geometrical center of the city was changing over these times. In 1920, Saratov became the center of the Volga River region. The city grew up and it becomes, uh, it gains a new breath for territorial development. Uh, and last but not least, 2016 and 17, uh, the legally documented governmental agreement saying that Saratov is becoming a center of agglomeration, the old city plan is adjusted, and uh, we need a new document for this agglomeration center. We can see that between these relevant events that defined the spatial structure of the city, the time intervals are 100, 120 years, and it doesn't depend on the social structure political system, anything else. It's like the rhythm of the city. The city lives, the conditions may speed up the development, they may slow down the development, but for some reason it always happens. The interesting thing for us is what is happening now differs uh, uh, by uh, the fact that we have very good prospects and it is not by chance that these events are happening now because the city is ready for it. If we look at these master plans, we can see that uh, Saratov was developing anti-clockwise in a spiral way. Uh, this process could have included the city of Engels. And interestingly enough, uh, one city is passing the energy to another. When Engels is developing, Saratov is slowing down. When Saratov is developing, Engels is slowing down. Another level of development is meso level. Uh, it's the stylistic zoning and morphological stylistic zoning. Stylistic zoning uh, is about division of different territories. It looks like the year rings on the tree. These kind of cities have a, the so-called floating center. Uh, as the administrative center of Saratov was moved from the museum square area, uh, uh, the museum square area was kind of forgotten. But we have very nice 18th century buildings there uh, that are uh, often neglected. Uh, we can see that in Saratov, many buildings have been well preserved. And since in the beginning of the 19th century, classicism, which was mainly localized on the Moscow Street, was replaced by eclectics, we had, well, Vitali, uh, Mr. Kudryatsev, I know you have slides. I think you should show the slides as well. Yes. Okay, we looked at the historical master plans. This is a brief travel in time when we were talking about the cycles of city development. This is the statistics, statistics of the Volga city cities. Look, in terms of population in, and in absolute figures of the budget the city has, it is number one in the Volga city, among the Volga cities. And if we look at where the money was invested in Saratov, we will see the first uh, articles of the budget are culture, healthcare, and city development. These three things defined the look of the city. Let's look at the stylistic zoning. This is the area of museum, district of museum square, classicism, and this is a reshaped, changed classicism on the Moskovska street. This is another period of eclectics, multiple styles. This is the end of the German st uh, street, and presently it's the Kirov Avenue. You can see the pseudo-Gothic elements. This is the building of conservatory, the Hotel Astoria. Um, the initial look of the St. Clementus um, Chapel Church uh, 
unfortunately it was not preserved and uh, we are uh, on the place of this place. Yes, uh, those who haven't been in Saratov, instead of the Pioneer Cinema Theater, there was a church of St. Clementus. After the revolution, they demolished the building, and then there was a cinema theater. Uh, modern buildings al around the present Volska Street, present days Volska Street, and some distinctive uh, parts of the streets. Uh, this shows another principle of the micro level, because even on the micro level, we have the special features. On Moskovska Street, for example, there were very interesting uh, uh, materials at the conference yesterday saying that um, the governor of Astrakhan Oblast, uh, where Saratov was um, um, part of it for uh, some time, There are different details of classical buildings on the streets of Moskovska and Chernyshevska. And uh, wherever we had the non-noble population living, we can see the elements of folk architecture on the buildings. And we can also see some Baroque elements uh, that were imitated and copied from the Troitsky Church of Saratov, the oldest church we had. So meso, mega, and micro levels uh, of Saratov urban development have quite uh, peculiar features. And if we know the these principles, it will uh, open um, uh, the new opportunities for further enhancement of the city. Thank you very much. You have perfectly fitted in the time allocated. I have a question to you. Considering the urban, cultural, historical context of Saratov, what do you think? Well, some changes are already underway. And we're talking about these changes as well. But um, maybe there are some things that we haven't been raising. And you, as a person who lived all his life in Saratov, and uh, a person with deep knowledge of the city, maybe you think we missed something. Do you think we missed something? In fact, I mentioned it in the very beginning. I think it's very important to look at the essential features of the city and its buildings. If we get to know them and if we get to feel them, we will develop this space based on these essential features. And then whatever we do will be organic, natural, and well adapted to the city. That's the most important thing so that whatever you do would be natural to the city. To speak in a simple language, we don't need to demolish the old and instead of 10 old buildings, build one huge shopping mall, right? Well, this was a bit too simplified approach that you mentioned, but I have to say it's very good that we managed to introduce the regulations in the city that would contribute to the preservation of the city center, which in our opinion is of great cultural interest. Secondly, the regulations uh, specify what can be done and what cannot be done, because different historical layers have their own rules, classicism, for example. And if you uh, built a a building next to it, uh, this building should be harmonious to, next to the classical building. And we do not necessarily um, toughly describe the stylistic features, but these principles should be observed. Uh, you know, if you have a picturesque facade of classicism, the next uh, facade should be at least um, matching in the style. Uh, yes, uh, otherwise, if we have too much eclectics, uh, we will turn from a European city in, into an Asian city, and we may lose our face. Well, you know, when I mentioned the stylistic zoning, I showed you some photos. But if you look at the buildings of other periods, you can see that there are there is a traceability of this law uh, uh, in other buildings as well. Thank you.
Uh, and now Alena Zhmurova, head of Saratov project from Strelka. Alena, the floor is yours. Well, uh, a lot has been mentioned today about different features of the city, about the potential, about the number of new housing and buildings being built in Saratov. Everybody mentioned the great history of the city. And yes, indeed, as it has already been mentioned today, it's a large city with a population of 843,000 people. And out of 1,111 cities in Russia, it's ranked number two after Krasnodar. In Europe, uh, Saratov can be compared with Stockholm, Amsterdam, Krakow. But at the same time, the city among the populations uh, of from half a million to one million, the city is ranked the lowest uh, in terms of GDP per capita. So the question arises, does the city have resources for development? The city has two crucial ways for development. We can look for years and years for a large scale investor and look for a big investment project. But on the other hand, the cities have resources that can be developed and they help to transform the city. And this brings the quick wins. What is this resource? What are we talking about? I would like to mention four resources or points of growth. Uh, small business and services. In the city center, there's a concentration of 62% of small business enterprises and 62% of the population work in the small and mid-sized businesses. Historical heritage. In Saratov, 2.5% of the buildings belong to the pre-revolutionary period. This means Saratov is among top 10 cities in Russia with historical um, uh, heritage. But the most important thing is not only the preservation of the buildings, but also the historical layout of the streets. This is a holistic environment, not just separate uh, buildings. Number three is the students. The young population under 30 years old amounts to 30% of Saratov population. This is one of the highest parameters in Russia. And number four is the Volga River. We can talk on and on about the, the importance of Volga for the development of Saratov. But I think it's important to say that today the city is absolutely separated from water by a stream of industrial territories. And we need to do something about it. We have been working with this project since November. and. We drew our attention to every f one of these four potentials and thought about the way they should be development. Number one is the refurbishment of public spaces. Of course, it influences the small business and it contributes to the development of small business. There has been developed a large scale program for the development of uh, civic spaces. It includes all the important parts of the city, the squares, the train station area, uh, the theater square, the main uh, place where the city events take place, the Kirov Square. It's a good example of an old city square where all the most important buildings are located, such as the marketplace, circus, cinema theater, church. And between these uh, public spaces, we uh, have a network of streets. And the main uh, streets in this network are pedestrian. Volskaya, Oktyabrskaya, and Kirova pedestrian streets. Then we have Rakhova Boulevard that is an access through the residential uh, neighborhoods and Moskovska Street that was developing throughout the centuries. Well, what is the beginning of this large-scale project? 
Uh, it will begin from Rahova Street. The developers of the concept are present here, and they will tell better about it. But what I would like to draw your attention to is the following. During the development of this project, we um, um, asked the opinion of the population, and we managed to consider many opinions in this project. For example, we initially did not consider the location of the uh, dog walking sites, and then we allocated spaces for them. And then at the design phase, we will consider also the difficulties with floodings that are um, typical for uh, a Latinsky Avrag area. Uh, the project will then be presented to the um, citizens and experts in the main city park, and everybody will have a chance to speak up, and the comments will be considered during the design stage. Uh, if you have any ideas on a refurbishment of Rakhova Boulevard, please submit them. Will this be done in the park? Yes. Well. As of today, uh, I think the on Kirova Street, uh, on the ground floor of uh, the um, Unified Center, uh, I think the post office is also open, and we collect there all, all the ideas and recommendations. The next area we were talking about today uh, are the systemic documents, such as the regulations or the guidelines we develop the um, uh, code uh, for Saratov and Duane will talk about it, as well as the design code. At the moment, we have completed the design stage of the for the for the code. We um, classified the morphology of the city, and then we will have a big stage, open workshops with the city population where we will listen to the problems and challenges of each district. Design code is a special chapter in the code. The reason why we need it, uh, we need it for the stylistic unity of the city environment. The first part of the design code has already been published. It includes the uh, designs of all the outdoor signages in the city. The first street uh, to um, comply with this uh, design code of outdoor signs is Kirova Avenue. We m met the owners of the buildings. We listened to the difficulties they encounter. And we realized that in the first version of this document, the main attention was uh, paid to the first line, first front line of the street. But uh, the Kirova Avenue is special because a lot of businesses are allocated on the, uh, not on just the ground floors, but first floors, uh, basements, and arches. So uh, all these tenants should also be considered. That's why we introduced the changes, and they uh, enable everybody uh, on the street to show uh, and represent their business on the first line of the street, at the same time to be harmonious with the city's historical look. Before the introduction of these rules, the mean uh, coefficient for the advertisements, banners, and outdoor signs amounted to 50%, and now the space for them is reduced to 20% of the facades. And of course, there's a strategy for the development of the embankment. The embankment development is a long-run project. Normally, these kind of projects uh, may take decades. And we can't simply start the project from dividing the embankment into sections. Well, this happens 
according to the land use uh, document, the functional use. We can't do it because it's the river facade of the city. It's a unique uh, face of the city looking at the river. And whatever you build there, it will stay there for a long time. And it will define the panorama of the city for the coming decades. For this reason, it's important to develop the strategy and understand what should be the housing, the buildings, the height, the density, public realm, civic spaces, what should be there and how we should interact with the city and what should happen there. I would like to tell you as well about the young generation and the way we work with them. For example, the pilot refurbishment project, you know, we, for this project we involved Alex Zyapkin, a young artist from Saratov. He developed the pattern that marks the new pedestrian zones. Wherever we had the pavement, I'm now talking about the area around train station. In the past, there was a road, and now we apply this pattern, for, first of all, for safety reasons, so that the drivers, when they drive, they would see that this is a pedestrian area now. We have already conducted more than 15 lectures. Most of them were conducted within Strielka Week. Our experts that work with us also gave lectures at the Saratov universities. This is Martin from Topotech Bureau um, during his lecture. He, he, he is supporting the Kirova Square project. You can see the neck of Adlen Goze, who is uh, consulting a snow project uh, company for Rachova Street uh, program. This is the student of Saratov University. Her name is Panun Udasheva. And she, together with another student, Yekaterina Kravchuk, was sent to an uh, internship uh, to estate for two months. You can see her photos uh, on Instagram. A week ago, she was in estate in Rotterdam. And yesterday, she was already on the street market in Saratov. She returned, and she was very happy about the internship she had. And she mentioned that it was a great experience. Moreover, we also got a letter of gratitude from Adlan Goze, who said that the uh, girls were really helping him much uh, with their knowledge about the city when he did the design. To conclude, I would like to say the following. In fact, every city has hidden resources that can be developed already now. And the citizens can support it. The spaces that used to be empty and abandoned can tomorrow become a matter of pride of the citizen. Thank you very much for a very interesting observation, and especially the info about Saratov girl who returned from Rotterdam. So we developed not only the spaces, but also we raised the agents of changes. Please, Dmitry Valentinovich, pen down the information about this girl and include her in the work for Saratov development. Moreover, there are two girls, and it's a double resource. I think we will meet with this girl this week, and we will discuss our further collaboration. Let's go to the next speaker, Mr. Dwayne Phillips, the head, I'm sorry, the head of DPZ Europe company, Berlin office. Many of you know Mr. Phillips already from his lectures at the university. And Dwayne, the floor is yours, please. You have seven minutes. You just speak on the microphone, Dwayne. Be natural and speak on the microphone. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I only have seven minutes, so I'll be very quickly. Uh, the, it says here, what could become a driver for development of Saratov, how to start changes in the city, and how to engage local residents. 
Okay. Driver for economic development. Make it easy to set up businesses and invest. Yeah. Money, it's all about the money. Okay. Bahrain. You go to a uh, shopping mall. You go into the store. The guy on the left-hand side, you give your passport to him. You tell him what kind of business you want to open. He goes to the back, does all the paperwork for you. You go to Starbucks. Half an hour later, they bring you back, have all the paperwork signed. You sign it off. You have your new business within 45 minutes. This is how you start economic development. Okay? You make it easy for people to start up their businesses. In the back room, they have all the people from all the different government departments already sitting there waiting to do your application. Okay? The thing you should do is, if you have a university city, is start to educate the people, the students, now before they leave the university so they can set up their businesses before they even finish their university. So the day after they graduate, they set up their own business and are working in Zaratov. They do not leave Saratov, they stay here because they have their businesses. Okay? So your local students, your local people are the economic drivers. How to start changes in the city? Make the planning and building approvals procedures easier to understand and streamline the process. No developer, no one will invest if it's complicated and it takes a lot of time. Okay? For example, in uh, Berlin, it takes you three months to get a building permit. In Potsdam, it takes you two years. So, where do the people go? They go to Berlin, all right? So, Saratov, you used to have a code that was uh, explained before that was very efficient, very urban, but over the years, your zoning codes were changed and this starts to happen, okay? And all of a sudden, this starts to happen. Why does this happen, okay? This gets complicated. And it's because your zoning code is a complicated zoning code. It has 75 different land uses. This is complicated, okay? Now, on the left-hand side, you see your current coding. It's designed by blocks. It's all about how you arrange the buildings inside the block. The old way of doing a code, and which is now becoming the modern way of doing codes, is to concentrate on how you do streets and urbanism, okay? So you control how your city will look. You don't let the developers control what you're looking at. You decide what you want. And this is called a form-based code. On the left-hand side, your current zoning code, which is a separation of uses. You live here, you work there, you ed uh, your education is there, your re recreation is there, and you have to drive everywhere. It leads to huge traffic problems. On the right-hand side is the form-based code, where we continue to use mixed use everywhere. It just depends upon the level of the urbanism. So, for example, this is Berlin, 1862. They were expecting to expand by a million people within 30 years. They drew the lines about where the blocks were to be, go, to be located. They drew a little drawing showing how you place the buildings onto the buildings, uh, onto the ground. And with these two drawings, they built some of the best areas of Berlin that ever existed within 30 years. It can be that simple. Two drawings built Berlin, okay? Now, we've looked back on this and discovered what the old codes were, and we adapted them to modern use and what we call smart growth. And out of that, we developed what we call the smart code, which is a framework for plugging in how you want to design your city, okay? And it works like apps. <laughs> You decide, do you want historical preservation? Do you want ecological development? Do you want uh, transit oriented design? All the specifics that are related to you go into this code so that it becomes a unique code for your city and for your country based upon your culture and what you desire. No smart code is the same anywhere in the world. It's specifically adapted to your city, okay? Now, codes are extremely complicated but they don't need to be. Currently, most codes are in text. The smart code changes it to graphics. These are the six types of urbanists, urbanist areas, and it's all done graphically. It shows you how you park. It shows you how you do your sidewalks. It shows you how you do your buildings. It shows what uses are allowed, and it shows how you all put it together, okay? You can have a seven-page code if you want, okay? And what's great is at the end of it, you come with a drawing for each area, okay? 
and you say to the developer, you give him this piece of paper, this tells you what you can build, how high you can build, how many square meters you can build, how many parking spaces you need. It's all on one single piece of paper. This encourages development immensely. Okay? We've been studying your specific urban, uh, forms of urbanism here in, the, uh, in Russia and in Zaratov. And we've been doing surveys about what the different areas of Zaratov look like and how the urbanism works in those areas and even the, the high-rise buildings of today. And so we're proposing to convert or transform your land use based code, which has 75 different land uses, to a form based code, which has nine. Okay? And this only describes the type of urbanism from low density to medium density to high density. Okay? And you'll see here, you can read it like a three-dimensional code. Blue is small scale, orange is medium scale, and red is the high rise. So we're, you're doing actually a three-dimensional code of your city. Okay? Now we explain it all so that everyone learns how to use it. And so, for example, if a developer comes or someone who wants to set up a business and redo a building, he looks and says, okay, I'm in zone three, which is blue, and you give him the piece of paper, this is what you do. Or if he comes and says, okay, I'm in the red zone, zone six, you give him a piece of paper and say, this is what you can do. It is so simple. Miami has adopted this code five years ago, and there's an absolute economic boom happening in Miami now because it's so easy to build. Now, the quality is even higher today than it used to be. You do not sacrifice quality for quantity. The form-based code really ensures the quality of the urban space. So, long-term future growth of Saratov. You have the historic area. It, in parts of it, it's wonderful. It's really working well. It reminds me a lot of Potsdam. It's a very European type of city. All of Potsdam is booming, but not all of Saratov is booming. Why not? This is a perfect center for startups, for young people to invest in. Okay? You see some, some people are already starting on their own, okay? which is great. This is a project we did in, in Bahrain. An old city area was really falling down. All the historic buildings were falling apart. No one had the money to do it. And we discovered that the codes encouraged people to knock down the historic buildings and build up concrete apartment blocks. They were losing their soul and they were losing their identity by this. So we did a historical preservation district with a buffer zone similar to what you've already done. We've done uh, architectural codes, how to maintain and keep these buildings and what kind of signage and everything else, just like what you're doing. Also how you do new buildings that are similar and, and work with the next door neighbor. But most important thing is we developed 21 economic strategies to refurbish these buildings. Without money, nothing happens, okay? And this was all private funding, no government subsidies. And we did a pilot project, which is extremely important to show people how it works. And this pilot project converted two old buildings into a, ho a hotel and a post office. And the whole street is now taking off. It's one of the best streets in Bahrain now. And what we can do in Zaratov, and this is a proposal that you may or may not want to do, is called the transfer of development rights. And what happens is, is the owner of the small building on the right-hand side, instead of knocking his building down, he is allowed to sell the air rights over his house to a developer in another area. Okay? So the owner of the little house gets the money, is able to fix up his house, and conduct his businesses. Okay? It's a very successful model that has been used all over the world for historic preservation areas. So, we are thinking of proposing the similar, similar thing for the center of Saratov. And one of the areas that these development rights could be transferred to is the embankment. Okay? The embankment is one of your most important resources. Okay? And they're already starting to build high-rises. Well, why don't you make some money out of this and redo and make it so that whoever wants to develop along the embankment has to buy the air rights over the historical preservation area. Okay? So you have this area, which could be done. 
Now, Barcelona has done this, and they have said it's one of the most beautiful promenades and embankments ever done, done that I've ever seen. It looks like this, and it was also done with transfer of development rights. And another area of the embankment you should do is this. This is your gateway to the city from the Volga River. This is a re not really very attractive, and you go up the steps and you get this. This is another area where the transfer of development rights could be implemented, and with spur development. The other one is the train station. I'm very happy to hear about developments at the train station. But you come out of the train station, you have your buses, you have your taxis, you have your stores, but it's not really very well done at the moment, okay? And you have 30,000 people coming in every day or going around. And what they did in London, this is an old picture of London, King's Cross, this was one of the worst areas of London, and they knew they had to do something. So they conducted a master plan, okay? where they invited residents and they took all these old buildings and, and a mixture of new buildings with residential, offices, shopping, everything else. The core of it was a new shopping uh, extension to the, uh, um, the railway station and the hotel. And today it looks like this. And it has regenerated the entire area to be one of the most prime properties in London. Okay? And this is the way the plaza looks today. Okay? Uh, another for the transfer of development rights would be the airport location. This is Denver Stapleton Airport. It's now out of commission. They built a new airport. What to do with all this land? It's also about 300 hectares. Okay. They did a master plan which included residential, offices, even industry and manufacturing so that you do not have to drive anywhere. It's all located within that area. And they did it based upon neighborhood zoning like our smart code where you have churches, you have everything, uh, education, schools, everything available. And this was the first vision of the master plan, where it is a low-rise, five-story uh, density type of development. This is the first pictures of it being built. The, f the first thing they did was to put in the parks. Yep. And please don't do the airport like this, okay? This would be the wrong thing to do, all right? So my last thing is, I'll skip very quickly to last, last project is the old industrial areas. We did a project in Poland, which has an old um, paper factory. It was very polluted. And what we did was we met with the local residents and we converted the factory into offices and uh, business startups. The workers' housing attached to it on the lower left was being refurbished. We've added more housing into the middle, and the school and the sports facilities were redone. And the area at the top is labeled for future development. And it's all done on an ecological basis that all the wastewater and the pollution is redone ec ecologically. And we did this as a so-called charrette with public participation. We went there for 10 days and worked with the historical preservation people, the environments, environmentalists, the local people, and we worked out this plan within 10 days so that everyone could accept it. And this was the most best way of doing it, and it's now official public policy. So, uh, yeah, my time is up, and that's my brief overview of what I think, uh, how we could, uh, or some ideas for Zaratov's development. Thank you. Dwayne, thank you so much for every time I listen to you, every time I find something new. Very interesting. Please tell me, Dwayne, every city has its DNA, has its specifics. What do you think is the main specifics of the public realm of Saratov today, of the civic spaces? Have you managed to sense it and see it during your research? or? Do you think everything is very typical for other cities as well? In the world, uh, Zaratov is almost a paradise. It's very well done. Uh, the problem is you have mud and you have, have to take care of things, okay? Uh, otherwise, it can be, it's a lot of work, but it can be simply done. You have the basis there. Um, Doha and Kuwait City is you're starting at zero, you know. So uh, Zaratov, I was extremely pleased, uh, very happy, very excited, and I think with love and care you can have a very, very beautiful city. And I think the key to it is 
the smart code because the smart code integrates all those other elements like the public realm, like the courtyards, like the parking. You have a serious problem with courtyards and parking, okay? And that, I'm going to be speaking about that tomorrow. And uh, with these integrated system of a smart code, you can solve your problems. Thank you so much. And we switch to the next speaker. Um, uh, Ever, the floor is yours, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I traveled um, a month. Um, and I, yesterday afternoon, I was in Naples, in Italy. And I flew to Saratov this morning, so it's from 26 to um, 4 degrees. I didn't see uh, much of your city yet, but um, I'm going to tell you a little bit also about what I, um, what I saw last month. I started in um, Croatia. I wanted to see Europe, but the Europe, the new Europe, the Balkan. And, um, I wanted to see what's happening there, because uh, what's happening there is essentially what's happening here as well. And I want to talk a little bit about that to find uh, the key to uh, the solution for uh, the future of the medium-sized city, because that is uh, where I want to talk about. I would like to see my slides. I gave five slides. I brought my presentation down from 22. <coughs> um, let me also say that uh, listening to, uh, to the speakers, to uh, uh, the people here on the table, I am already uh, very impressed because uh, you are really, you are really uh, doing uh, some very important things. And um, I can say this because uh, I, I visit a lot of conferences. Like uh, the last year, uh, Shanghai, Liverpool, uh, Rio de Janeiro, many, many cities, many, many projects everywhere. And most of the time, it's about the hardware. It's the architects. It's the city planners. And we all know that the computer is the hardware, but that you don't have anything on the computer if you don't have the good software. So let me talk about the software. Let's not forget that the program, the things that people do, the economy of your city, the reason why people are here is the most essential thing for the survival of your city. So I agree with my neighbor that the code to, for the building can be a very important thing for you in the future to create a beauty and an attractiveness. But the most important thing is to work with your talented students. And I've heard you telling me that you have a lot of universities here, that you have a lot of students here, and I can already give you my conclusion of my talk. Start to work with them. And your success is really in the number of students that you are able to keep here in this city. Because what's going on? in the world. I show you first this map. These are the 4,000 cities in the world with more than 100,000 inhabitants. The first thing we should understand, I think is a very important aspect, is that in a circle of 5,000 kilometers within the middle Hong Kong, half of the world population lives. So we are somewhere out there. You know, we are actually not really anymore in the middle. But there are some other uh, 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 things we should know. Europe, and Russia for me is, is, a, is an impart, important part of Europe, still for many people is uh, uh, the place where they, where, where, where they look at when they uh, want to uh, talk about uh, 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 quality, when they want to talk about quality of life, and when they uh, look at cities and how things should be. Here we have Russia. And f for me, the big uh, uh, issue that is going on in the world today is migration. Um, in the year 1000, 10% of the world population lived in cities. 
Ten years ago, half of the world population lived in cities. In 25 years, in the next 25 years, 75% of the world population will live in cities. And the sad thing is that most of those people go to the mega cities, to the big ones, because the big ones have on offer what they are looking for. The reason why people migrate is essentially very simple. It's to get a better future. And the reality today is that most people think that this better future is in the bigger city. And I am a huge promoter of the second city, of the, of the, of the medium-sized city. Because look at, look at Russia. You have 180 million people with a Russian passport. 20 million of them, and that is more than any other country in the world, if you talk about the percentage, live outside Russia. 20 million people with a Russian passport live outside your borders. Another 20 people live in Moscow. Then we have around eight in St. Petersburg. Then we have some 10 or 20 cities with 500 thousand to one million people, which means that another hundred million people live in the middle of nowhere. These people are in those 25% that I was talking about. These people are going to live in the city in the next 25 years. And the big issue is, where do they go? Are they going to Saratov or are they going to Moscow? And my point is that the better you make Moscow, the more you invest in Moscow, the worse it gets. Because every solution there makes the problem bigger. Think about New York, think about London, think about Paris, think about Amsterdam. We have too many tourists. There are so many people coming to Amsterdam that the prices of the, of the real estate go over the top. The middle class is completely pushed away, so we have a city with poor people, with rich people, and the people that should be there, that have to work there, that have to do the jobs, are, are gone. The same is happening in London, the same is happening in Paris, the same is going to happen in Moscow. And we should not do that. I think now is the moment to say we shouldn't do that. We should immediately start to invest in the medium-sized city. And when we talk about those medium-sized cities, I think when we want to talk about the solution, there's one other important thing I have to say, and that is the creative economy. There is a lot of talking about the creative economy, but I want to uh, put, it, put it here that creative economy is not about culture. It's not only about artists. It's about a new uh, way we uh, make money with producing things. And I want to show you that with this slide. I want to go very fast in it. Like, in the beginning we have only agriculture. It's not only agriculture, it's mining, it's fishing. The important thing with that part of the economy is that it was connected to the land. It's easy to understand if you are a farmer, you need a farm and you need land. Then we have the industrial economy. The industrial economy was uh, uh, industrializing agriculture, but also in the industrial economy, all the economy was connected to the city. In the information economy, it became easier to go somewhere else. In the creative economy, where we have creative services on top of all these other things, um, the products can essentially be made everywhere. And when I talk about the creative economy, I want to talk about my phone. Because the most interesting example of creative economy is the Apple iPhone. The Apple iPhone is the most expensive phone on the market. The price of the phone, though, is only, the, the product is only 20% of what you pay. The other 80% you only pay for the brand. So Apple, at this moment in the world, is the richest company. 
with all their money, all their profit they have, they could buy the five next companies in the world, they could easily uh, have them, they have so much money in the bank, and that is because we are all so stupid to pay five times as much for a brand that is exactly the same as this Chinese telephone that I have, that is only 20% of the price. Now, your clothes, your hairdresser, your uh, glasses, your car, everything you buy, you buy a large part of that money for the brand. And the interesting thing is that the economy that is done by the people who do that is no longer connected to land. It can be done everywhere. And that is interesting. Now here we see who is actually moving. This is a very important graph because we talk a lot about people moving to the city, wanting to have people back. We do large investments in airports, we build houses, we want to attract people. But the reality is that people between 10 and, let's say, 35 years, they move. This is a graph for the Netherlands, but it's exactly the same in America. It's exactly the same in Italy. And it, I didn't see the one for Russia, but I'm sure that it's exactly the same. People move when they are young. Below 40, we move, and above 40, we become tourists. We only move and go back to where we came from. Now, in the beginning of the curve, the movement is caused by where we are going to have our study, the place where we want to have our university, where we want to have our higher education. And then when the curve goes down between 25 and 35, that is the important part of the curve. Because I always say you have to catch the fish where it's swimming. And these are the students in the last year of the university. These are the 300,000 students here in Saratov. And if you want to make it yourself easy, what to do next year or what to do in your projects, Ask all of them, ask these students to write down the five points that they think are important for you to do to make them stay. Five points. And if you collect those five points and you do like the Eurovision Song Contest or you make some clever calculation and you find the five most important points and you start to work on that for the next 10 years, after that, you will find out that they actually stay. And they are the most important thing you have. Not your buildings, not your land, not the Volga, those students, those talented students. Because if you can't make them stay here, they will go to Moscow, and not only to Moscow, they will preferably join the, two, the 20 million that are already outside Russia, and we can have the profit of them. So, to come to a conclusion, the most important thing for the, for the uh, regeneration of your city is the talent that you have. Give them those empty buildings, work with them, find reasons invest with them if they have if they have a small business use them ask them to work for you make it possible for them to stay that is the most important thing you can do be, beneath, be, next to that, of course, they want to organize a festival. Of course, they want to have open space. Of course, they want to have good restaurants. But all these things will follow by themselves because this is the way the market works. But you, the older gen generation, the people above 40, the tourists, so to say, the only thing we have to do is allow our youngsters to stay. And the next thing that makes that very uh, 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 nice is that you have some young people in your surroundings and uh, you do not have to wait for them to visit you because they are still here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Everett. From Roundtable on the Space, 
we switch to the human capital uh, topic, and I think it's a very important idea that should have a continuation and development. We really hope that the government of Saratov Oblast, and not only, will continue this work with the students. And I'd like to continue your message on people and give the floor to Mikhail Alexeyevsky the head of the City Anthropology Center. Um, uh, he conducted the study and interviews of the um, Saratov population. And Mr. Alexeyevsky, I'd like to ask you, what are the special things you found uh, from in Saratov? What was surprising about Saratov? Yes, indeed. We conducted several studies in Saratov that are related to the city perception, urban environment perception. Our center did not conduct this study standalone. We were in partnership with our colleagues from Saratov, Volga University of Management and Saratov State Technical University. Because I have to say that Saratov prouds one of the strongest regional schools of social anthropology. And, and this is something that describes the city very well. And yes, indeed, we conducted a lot of deep interviews among experts, citizens. And by the way, this process involves students as well. And they were enthusiastically uh, asked about the way they perceive city and the citizens perceive the city. Uh, one area which is very important for our round table is the way the citizens perceive Saratov and the, what they think is special about Saratov. What are the strengths and weaknesses of Saratov? And what is the way they see the future of Saratov? And on one hand, we can see that it's very important for the citizens of Saratov uh, to have the things that are um, determined geographically. Number one is Volga River. It's very, very important for Saratov. That's why the, your work with the embankment is really important. You should develop it onwards. Architectural heritage. Uh, of the city is important as well. And I would like to add one more thing here. We spoke about architectural heritage, but it's equally important to understand the cultural heritage. We need to understand that Saratov has uh, rich cultural traditions, the third conservatory in Russia, the fifth university, the first provincial circus, the first provincial museum, provincial meaning non-capital, of course, but these let's say intellectual traditions are a very important part of the city's heritage and its modern times. Well, students, we have spoken a lot about them and indeed that it is the potential. I absolutely agree with the colleagues that students are probably the most important point of growth. As far as the problems are concerned, Um, uh, the problems are, for example, the risk to lose the human capital. Saratov uh, attracts uh, young people from uh, adjacent areas. It gives very good education to them. And then they ask themselves a question, what to do, where to go. And here, I believe one of the most important aspects of the city development is hidden. It's the question about the ambitions of the city. It's not a secret that Saratov is not the richest city in Russia. It doesn't have any golden ores or a oil fountain in the city center. By the way, they produce oil in Saratov. Well, at least in some in some other cities of Russia, we have bigger oil reserves, let's say. And in this sense, it's not the largest city of Russia. But as it has been shown in the previous presentations, uh, Saratov is a model of a typical Russian city. 
so one important theme of our interviews was the question about the ambitions of the city. We are used to the idea that the bigger the city is, the more opportunities and possibilities for the development it has. Saratov is not that big and that rich. And in this sense, uh, trying to, I don't know, uh, compete with some giant uh, cities is not uh, for Saratov. It will, will simply not be able to compete. But the city has its own oil. Somebody, maybe some people don't see it, but some pay attention to it. But the treasure of Saratov is the human capital. Uh, and the human capital was very well spoken about by the previous speaker uh, uh, and um, Mr. Verhagen mentioned it and uh, as we all know human capital is the main asset for the 21st century and Saratov has it. What people uh, said they don't want to ha see in Saratov is they don't want to have ginormous projects in Saratov. It's not typical for Saratov. They don't want to hear these stories that we will build the biggest, the longest, the most, uh, I don't know, ginormous thing. They People don't believe this is the uh, important thing the city should do. On the other hand, in the interviews, the respondents said that they do pay attention to the quality and comfort. They don't want to live in an ambitious city, but they want to live in a city that's comfortable. And Aliona has very well put it that the development of civic spaces contributes to the development of small businesses. You can now go to Saratov Embankment and see a wonderful picture. You will see the rows of pavilions food courts uh, where people from Moscow and young Saratov entrepreneurs brought their food and they are selling it. You will be surprised. I went to see where the queues are the longest and I have to say that the Saratov restaurateurs have the longest queues. Instead of uh, queuing up for the Moscow food, the local people prefer to go to the local young people and buy the food from them. And we can see this civic space, which becomes a good way to develop the young businesses. And this is the way it should work. And in this sense, the refurbishment, which is very often perceived as something secondary, um, in fact, it matters a lot. And one of the strengths of city development is that it's not so expensive. You know, to make the square better, to make a nice park is not as expensive as to build a huge industrial plant or a shopping mall. But the effect can be huge. And that's why I think Saratov is on the right way. and. I wish uh, the human capital, the oil of Saratov, would become the great fuel for the city development. Thank you very much, Mikhail. And we will go to Sergei Serdyukov, the general director of Snow Project. This company is developing the design of Rakhova Street. Mm. And Sergei, I have a brief question to you. Please tell us about the project of refurbishment. How do you solve the challenges? What are the challenges and how do you solve them? Rakhova Street is, first of all, a connection between city center and the city park. It's a transit street. Apart from this, it also contains recreation functions. The local population use this street for the short-term leisure. Before starting the design of the street, we deemed it's important to uh, ask the local population's opinion because this street goes through the several residential districts. Over 600 respondents participated in our interviews and the problems and recommendations they raised largely coincided with our vision, but at the same time, we discovered something new in their responses. 
for example, in on Rachova Street, we have a lot of people with pets, and many people walk with their dogs, and many parents. They use the Rachova Boulevard as a small park where they need to walk with their child. What will the new Rachova Street give to the city? First of all, it's a street that should become an example in terms of function and comfort. It should have good public uh, civic space and uh, it should be uh, very comfortable and uh, without any barriers to use this street. At the same time, the city should get more meaningful points, let's say. Uh, nice illumination, nice art objects uh, that will be located on the street will help us to give more meaning to it. And my last question. Uh, Aliona, please correct me if I am wrong. The colleagues from the Dutch office uh, came to you and they conducted workshops. What did you benefit? Uh, what did you gain from this work? And uh, was it, uh, were you able to efficiently collaborate? Well, I think it was a great, invaluable experience for us. If uh, we were told a year ago that this state would come and consult us, it would we would perceive it like a joke. It was a great experience for us. And first of all, of course, the trend that was highlighted, it's a very important trend. Uh, we heard that the new trend about the street is classics and certain calm uh, features should be there. It shouldn't be, you know, crying out. It shouldn't be trendy and booming. It should be something that's built for 20, 100 years ahead. And we tried to be guided by these things to create a calm zone which yet has a certain meaning that reflects the identity. Of course, comfortable and convenient uh, uh, in terms of ergonomics. Okay, we are now finishing our round table and I'd like to conclude and say that we had a really interesting discussion indeed. Thank you very much, all the speakers. A short question to Dmitry Valentinovich as a conclusive question. Dmitry Valentinovich, we know that you are developing the new master plan of the city. What are the values embedded in this master plan? And uh, I know it's in the process of development. What do you think should be there? Thank you. If we're talking about the new master plan of the city, uh, it should highlight, it should reflect the main features uh, that are as follows. The time limit, 2035, is our threshold um, for the successful implementation of the master plan. By that time, our population is expected to grow uh, for more than 150,000 people more. We are also try trying to increase double the times the green areas in Saratov by that time. Well, this is about spatial things. What about the non uh, target um, parameters, intangible assets. In 2035, what should be the Saratov about? Well, based on the messages we heard today, uh, the construction, I think the city should develop and be built in a comfortable manner and we shouldn't have any booming developments. We would like to have a city where one wants to stay and live. I have noted and mentioned all the ideas and good messages of the speakers, especially the one about the students. You mentioned five questions we need to ask the students. I promise we will conduct this uh, poll among the students and um, uh, great uh, many other great ideas. We, it's noted, and I hope we will succeed. Uh, the last floor to Evert. Yeah, I wanted to add one thing, and that is when you have all the students, you also have the university. And I think it's very important to put the university in the middle of the city, to, to connect 
this uh, uh, base of knowledge with the normal people in the city, instead of putting that university somewhere in the outside, as we very often see in Russia. Because when you connect the students to the normal environment in the city, you also create this uh, environment, this milieu, that is very important to, to, keep, them, to keep them here. And you make it nicer for, for the rest of your city to have a university. So the students will be a magnet in the city center that develops small business and it attracts more. It will create a comfortable environment and it will, students will act like a magnet. Thank you so much, everybody. Dmitry Valentinovich, the general message from all of us, take care of the people, of the young talents. The example of Strelka is uh, that we invested in the education of two students from Saratov and maybe this is a good example for the government of Saratov Oblast to invest in the good people and then they will work for the region and make it better. Thank you very much everybody and now we will have uh, Jeff Speck with a little uh, delay but we will have a session with Jeff Speck. Thank you.